early hour at the, yes. in the weekend. On the Shabbat too. On the Shabbat, horrible, yeah. Uh, okay, we have an interesting mixture of presentations and panels today that will challenge our conceptions of Wikipedia and will show us that everything you know, we know about Wikipedia is wrong. We have six people who will somehow be doing this together, and those are Oliver, James, Kat, Kim, Karen, and Tom. Uh, I managed. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot of K's. So uh, we'll, I will leave the stage for Oliver uh, to handle. Enjoy. <coughs> Hello. So this originally came about essentially because lots of us who knew each other were doing things that didn't really fit in everywhere else and decided that it would be nice to have something that uh, acted as a place for all the little whack job presentations to go uh, where they you know, could get safety in numbers, which is kind of what Wikipedia is to the rest of the real world, I think. So the first one is uh, mine, and that's on unreferenced BLPs and defamatory information. Uh, it's slightly wider than that. To give some background, last year I went to uh, Wikimania in Gdansk, where we had a presentation on unreferenced BLPs, and I interrupted with annoying questions so many times that James insisted I sit on the damn panel. Uh, the result was that I came away with two impressions. Firstly, this is a subject people want to discuss, and secondly, this is a subject which... Um, we need to go back to the basics on. Um, people tend to start halfway through the conversation before explaining precisely what the issues are. So I thought I'd take a moment to uh, explain what the issues are and then look at the main arguments for and against and those ones that I've been addressing. So for those of you who don't know what unreferenced BLPs are, and I appreciate it's probably a very small number, um, BLPs are biographies of living persons. And to lack references is to mean that there's absolutely no indication of where the information in the articles comes from. And this can be very problematic, uh, as we've seen over the years. So first we had the Siegenthaler incident, in which a rather notable and reputable American was noted in his article as being responsible for the JFK assassination, which gathered us a lot of media attention, very little of it positive. There's also the phenomenon of death by Wikipedia, which is essentially when Wikipedia reports somebody's death incorrectly and the mainstream media then picks it up in response and starts running all their pre-written obituaries, which can be very embarrassing for us, for the newspapers, and for the person in question who finds themselves receiving lots of phone calls from people wondering what on earth is going on. Um, perhaps the least reported, but at the same time most official uh, incident involving this was that of Seth Blatter, uh, who's a rather important sports executive who was, uh, in 2010, awarded uh, the Order of the Lion in Gold, which is an official medal. Uh, due to some sourcing issues with the person who put the presentation together for the medal, the official citation and certificate reads that for exemplary efforts in the promotion of professional sports, the Order of the Lion in Gold is hereby awarded to Josef Sepp Belend Blatter because they've taken it directly from his Wikipedia article and not, it seems, read it. So we've seen that, you know, unreferenced BLPs can cause issues in the real world, but it's a problem for far bigger issues than just that, uh, reasons than just that. The first one is that it harms our contributors. This is fairly obvious. The foundation has protection from being sued. Individual contributors do not. If people post information that is inaccurate about real-world figures, they can find themselves in serious real-world harm. Secondly, it harms the encyclopedia. Uh, again, this shouldn't take much of an explanation, but when we have an article which reads that Josef Sepp Belend Blatter is a noted sports executive, and that makes its way into official citations, the official organisations do look very stupid, uh, but similarly, so do we. It's very difficult to convince people that we're a reliable encyclopedia or even that we're something that people should contribute to when we make mistakes like this. And most importantly, it harms the subjects of the articles. People tend to think that this isn't as big an issue as it actually is. I'm not sure why. I think it's possibly because most Wikipedians aren't subjects or are in a privileged situation where 
in an environment like this, they have a great amount of anonymity. And as such, there's uh, some empathy lacking for what happens when one of the top ten red websites in the world incorrectly reports stuff. Uh, Real-world subjects can find themselves um, the victims of some serious hurt over this. They can find themselves, uh, you know, legally defamed. And in some situations, as I've shown, there's the possibility that anything from their personal life to their career can be very, very badly damaged. So, in an effort to deal with this, uh, the English Wikipedia has set up a series of things in an attempt to mitigate the problem and ensure that uh, our unreferenced uh, BLPs are dealt with. So the first is something called the BLP prod, which is a modified version of the proposed deletion tool. What it says is that um, BLPs created after a certain date without any references uh, can be prodded with that as a valid rationale. And uh, that cannot be removed unless references are provided. And if references are not provided, then the article is deleted. Everyone wins, except for the person who created it in the first place, but in many cases they should have known better. Uh, the second is Wiki Project Unreferenced BLPs, which does what it says on the tin. Um, it's a collection of users who are interested in this problem and want to fix it, be it by using deletion methods or by fixing up the actual articles that are causing the issues. Uh, the third is LaraBot, which essentially goes around finding the people who created articles marked as unreferenced BLPs and tells them, you know, you might want to reference this because if you don't, it could be deleted or it could be, you know, messed around with. Uh, this has been very, very successful. So as of last night, we have around 2,000 unreferenced BLPs. Um, at this time last year, we had around 30,000. However, there are still a lot of people who are don't see unreferenced BLPs as as big a problem as they actually are. There are a lot of reasons for this, some of which are valid and some of which are invalid. And one of the ones I hear most commonly is the idea that the vast majority of unreferenced BLPs don't contain defamatory statements. And as such, we should be focusing on partially referenced articles. Now, this is very well and good, but it excludes a couple of things. Firstly, we're not looking just for defamatory information. There can be things which are legally fine, but which cause serious harm and which, if unreferenced, definitely shouldn't be there. And secondly, I conducted a small study which essentially showed that this is just wrong. The idea that the vast majority of unreferenced BLPs don't contain problematic statements or problematic comments or problematic entries is wrong. So, one of the things I learned from this study uh, that may interest you, you've probably seen this map of the English Wikipedia. I apologise for the uh, quality and for the quality of the next one. In my experience, the unreferenced BLPs are more divided like that. Um, I, I don't know how Hollywood's doing at the moment, but if Bollywood is putting this much time and effort into writing about their films, then they can probably, you know, spare some time to direct. I think the American film industry should probably be looking for them, to them for tips rather than the other way around. So anyway, uh, I looked at 450 articles, um, picked because the first category I looked in was 150 articles, which is a nice round number, uh, split over three different categories, ranging from August 2010 to June of this year. And I found an interesting number of statements which were problematic, but I'd just like to check that you all agree with me that something like this, unreferenced, is an issue. A professional musician who is noted in his Wikipedia biography as unable to continue in his profession. That is something which can cause real-world harm. That is something which can irreversibly damage someone's career. It's quite possibly true, but this doesn't change the fact that we need to either verify that it's true or get rid of it, because keeping it around in the meantime is the source of serious issues. Um, another one, this guy is a democratic pollster, a rather famous democratic pollster, who is apparently known for making sensationalist claims such as, they can't fucking count, that's the democrat's problem. Again, possibly true, but without references there's no way to tell and it could have a serious impact. So, I looked through these 450 articles, I found uh, statements that were problematic, of similar nature to this one mostly, so I hope 
if you agree with me that these, these statements can cause, is, cause issues, you won't question the validity of the rest of the data, which is gathered under similar uh, circumstances. I found that there were 54 articles out of those 450 uh, which contained statements like this one. And that's not a very large number. So try 12% of the articles in the unreferenced BLP categories, on average, contain defamatory or problematic statements. Try one in nine unreferenced BLPs contain such statements. This is not something which is not a big problem. This is not something where the vast majority of these articles don't have issues. And sure, it's possible that uh, referenced fully or partially um, biographies might have similar issues, and even it possibly in a greater number. It's rather hard to tell because they're not, um, in some cases, categorized in the same way that these are. But just because uh, they pose a potential bigger problem does not mean we should stop dealing with this one. It doesn't mean that uh, this is not an issue. We should, I mean, the uh, American government is quite understandably concerned about nuclear weapons. This does not mean that biological and chemical weapons fly under the radar. Uh, that's about it. Uh, does anyone have any questions? There will be a, I must point out, half-hour panel at the end in which um, what I'm talking about and what anyone else is talking about and whatever you wish to air can be discussed. I can't actually see into the audience, so if... Uh, <laughs> ah, okay. uh, the next one, then, will be uh, Karen, I believe. Move around with the mouse, then when you're done. Ah, you've got that, haven't yeah. you? Okay. Never mind, I'll just. Just transfer it over, can you? To this machine? Yeah. I've got a USB pen, if that helps. I emailed it. I thought we were being allowed to use our own machines. This, yeah, but if you want to move, move it around, you have problems. Okay, and the mouse. Use this mouse, so then when you're done, hit that button, and you can use these two to go forward and back on slides. Mm. And I'll just stand here. Pardon? I think I'll just stand here. Okay, that works. Sorry, I thought I was going to be allowed to use my own machine. As said, I'm Karen, I'm user Fluffernutter on the English Wikipedia, and I'm going to be talking about paid editing. Is that better? Sorry, vertically challenged. <laughs> All right, I'm Karen, I'm user Fluffernutter on the English Wikipedia, and I'm going to be talking about why paid editing is like ne a needle exchange. First, let's start with some very basic information. Wikipedia is serious business. I'm going to go for a little humor throughout so that we don't end up punching each other by the end of the presentation. All right, so let's start with some definitions. In the very most general sense, almost all of us can be said to be paid editors because most of us edit from work. But I think we can all agree that that's not really what we mean when we say someone is a paid editor. So we cross that one out. You can also have people who exchange edits in kind. You'll see people saying, if you review my good article, I'll review yours. Again, yes, there's compensation, but this isn't really our concern. Which brings us to the more problematic categories, which is paid employees, things like interns or PR people for a company who are editing company's articles, or a freelancer, people who are experienced Wikipedians that answer job postings on job websites. So why is this a problem? Well, an editor who's paid to create or change an article is an editor who has something other than the best interests of Wikipedia in mind. They are inherently non-neutral, which is not to say that they're not capable of being neutral, but that is not why they're here. And so what this actually manifests as is a set of problems, things like whitewashing. A person from a company who comes on sees unfavorable content about their company and removes it usually by blanking it with no edit summary. Um, advertising, things that would get 
you know, speedy deleted if they were a standalone ar article. You know, North Malden Productions is England's premier company for Icelandic sagas. Call us. And if you get that joke, tell me afterward. Um, or ownership of articles. You know, I work for the Spanish Inquisition Productions, and we did not say you could put this information in our article. Take it out right now. So let's look at edits by paid employees. I'm generalizing here, but I'm going to say that edits by paid employees and edits by freelancers tend to have slightly different qualities. So a paid employee is, you know, hey, you're interning for the summer. Our business doesn't have an article. Go write us one. The good news is that these editors probably want their article to stick around. They probably care about their job. They probably care about their company. And, you know, they want it to be worthy of Wikipedia. The cons are that these are usually the people you see editing article called Company X with the username Company X. And these are the people who are going to catch a block very quickly. And these are the people who are going to not really get a chance to engage with the community. They're going to be shot on sight, so to speak. Um, and this is what our typical paid employee might look like. I just wanted to create an article. No one said I couldn't. Now we have edits by freelancers. And as I said, these are all quite often paid uh, experienced Wikipedians, people who pick up job postings that advertise for an experienced Wikipedian who's able to get an article past our safeguards. And so the good news is that these people are experienced. They know what they're doing. The bad news is because they're being paid for it and because, because of the environment on English Wikipedia, they must do it under the table, they generally have very little incentive to make an article that's worthwhile for anything other than skipping past CSD and staying on the Wikipedia. Assume good faith, even in the face of, well, an experienced editor hiding their motivations. So we have a forking path here with regard to people who conduct paid editing. We have editors who mean well, but they stumble over our policies and guidelines. They'll have a promotional username, they'll be adding um, promotional content, and they won't realize that this is necessarily a problem. Then we have editors who know exactly what they're supposed to be doing and are not doing it, or are doing it as little as possible. These people will tend to slip through the net to begin with, but will often cause more disruption in the long run. These are the people you'll see on ANI and on the drama boards getting uh, ARBCOM or getting a community ban or just getting a lot of people screaming about it. And the third fork would be the editors who follow our policies, turn out neutral content, and get paid for it. These may exist. We don't know. If they exist, they're right next to the invisible pink unicorn. Um, so the short version here, which is not that short, is that we click, quickly block editors who are good faith newbies who cross a very obvious line for usernames, for adding promotional content. But often they're willing to follow the rules if someone will explain them. But the experienced editors who know what they're doing and edit in a contradictory manner to that tend to slip through. And the experienced editors who edit for pay and do follow our guidelines, well, we don't even know they exist. So what I'm proposing is a sense of harm mitigation. Harm mitigation is basically the idea that you can't completely eliminate the harm of a bad habit or uh, an addiction or something like that, but you can make it hurt slightly less. So the canonical example here is the needle exchanges for IV drug users. You can put all your funding toward stopping drug addiction and make these IV drug users stop using drugs. But that's incredibly difficult to the point of near impossibility, and it's incredibly expensive. What actually works is needle exchanges. Let the addicts remain addicted. Give them clean needles. This is not a perfect solution because they're still addicted. They're still carrying out unhealthy habits, but they're not going to get HIV or hepatitis while they're doing it. So you're mitigating the harm of this drug addiction. And so how can harm mitigation work on Wikipedia? Well, there will always be paid editors who want to put their personal gain above Wikipedia. And we can't really stop them with, unless we completely lock down the encyclopedia, and that's just not going to happen. But the people we can catch are the people who would be willing to play by the rules if someone will just show them what the rules are. What if we could catch those and show them what the rules are? So why don't we triage the concept of paid editors? So triage, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a medical concept of sorting people by how much help they need. Um, this is used in mass casualty incidents, emergencies. Someone who's seriously injured and must be helped right now gets immediate priority. Someone who's injured but won't die without help this moment, in, in this particular graphic, they're listed as moderate. Someone who doesn't need any help is listed as non-injured. 
and someone who can't be helped, someone who's dead or someone who needs such heroic intervention that they probably won't survive to make it to the hospital, they get delayed status, they're put at the bottom of the list. So if we wanted to triage our paid editors, what would be the analog to this? So people who need no help are the experienced editors, the ones that probably do exist, the ones who are editing neutrally according to our guidelines and getting paid for it, and we don't know because they're doing it well. The ones who can't be helped are the experienced editors who hide their motivations and the newbies who are here to spam and for no other reason. But in that middle ground of can be helped, must be helped, we have the inexperienced editors, the PR people who are willing to work with Wikipedia's guidelines if someone will show them what Wikipedia's guidelines are. So here's where I start proposing things, and um, I'm actually not married to the concept of exactly what I'm proposing as opposed to the concept of just doing something. But we could add a new line to our COI guideline saying something like, if you are editing for pay, if you have been commissioned to create this article, it is required that you disclose this information at the COI notice board or you use this new template that will identify your article as that. And add an edit notice to new article creations telling people the same thing. So what would this do? This would require people who are editing for pay to disclose that they're editing for pay. This isn't gonna catch everyone because as, as I said, we have the people who can't be helped or will not let themselves be helped. So this would catch people who are editing in good faith, PR people, employees, who don't realize that they're going wrong. And it will funnel them to somewhere where they can have their edits evaluated or be helped. This isn't gonna catch the unrepentant spammers or the freelancers. They're a much more difficult problem, as I said. So if we can help the people who can be helped, rather than wasting energy chasing the people who can't be helped. Not to say that we can't also chase them, but, so the, the idea here is to pick the low-hanging fruit. The people who are willing to be helped are the easiest to help. And if we can pick them off, we're eliminating part of the problem of paid editing. We're not eliminating the whole problem, but we're eliminating a large chunk of it. So what would be the result of this? Paid employees, newbies, editing in good faith, those people who are willing to be helped, they'll let us help them. The people who just want to spam, they just want to add a link to their website, they don't care what we say, we don't, they don't care that that's not allowed, well, they're going to do it anyway, but at least we'll be able to block them under the concept of failed to disclose. Similarly, paid freelancers, people who are con concealing this, experienced editors who otherwise would end up on A&I, will be slightly easier to get rid of under the concept that they failed to disclose under our guideline. And in short, if we implement this, it may actually cut down on paid editing drama. The end. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, could you please the Yes, check right here. Yeah. Say that constitutes a sort of. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Anyways, as the current practice is, if you edit a company article behind a username that's the same name as the company, you quickly get in trouble because there's an obvious conflict of interest there. Yet, couldn't you argue that that at the same time is a, so, is a form of conflict of interest disclosure? Because you're making it clear, yes, I'm art editing this article, yes, I represent this company, so I think this is a sort of disclosure which would fall in line with your proposal. So would you recommend discontinuing that practice where if you edit behind a company username, you immediately get in trouble? Um, it's a valid point that you're making, which is that uh, a promotional username is a disclosing username. but. Promotional usernames are banned under our username policies, as you know, and um, I think it may end up being more trouble than it's worth to go about changing that policy. Again, harm mitigation. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Way in the back. I'll get a mic up to you. In the back. Stand up, please. Up here. Way in the back. Thank you, sorry about the delay. I expect many people in this room are from other editing communities than the English Wikipedia, face similar problems, but would really benefit if you and the rest of the speakers would maybe unpack the acronyms a little. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank 
So I think I referenced COI, which is conflict of interest. Um, I'm trying to think. There are about a dozen others. <laughs> ANI is uh, Administrator Notice Board for Incidents, which is where the dramatic incidents go to be discussed and acted upon. And uh, yeah, I apologize. <laughs> UAA is Usernames for Administra Administrator Attention, which is the board where problematic usernames are reported to for action. Any others? <laughs> uh, polo shirt back here, yes. Is there on any Wikipedia standard form for declaring conflict of interest on the user's page? If there is, and again, I only operate on English Wikipedia, I haven't heard about it. That would be wonderful to hear about if it does exist on some Wikipedia, though. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, I want to share some experiences. Uh, I came very late for your talk, but uh, I'm sharing an experience on the paid translation. Uh, we had a project running by Google in IndicWikis. Uh, they paid some translators and asked them to edit in Wikipedia, uh, and it was not a good experience. Like uh, on the day of beginning day, we had a talk by the professor, and he said, "When you give money for donating blood, actually less people start uh, donating the blood." Uh, we saw a similar effect that people who normally edit and correct other articles, they were not willing to edit the paid articles. Uh, they said, "Okay, someone who is paid is creating a mess. Why should I go and edit it? One waste my time." And the people who are getting paid to edit, they have so much time and my, uh, full effort, so they are creating mess at a multiple rate. They, they were not aware of the Wikipedia policies, and they were just paid to edit, and they create a lot of mess and multiple folds, so the volunteers didn't have time and, uh, and motivation to fix all of them. And they really didn't uh, sync with the community. Uh, they were treating that as a job, and uh, it didn't go well at the last. And finally, when the project was closed down and it was kind of banned in some wikis, uh, the paid translators even were scolding the volunteers that you spoiled our work and so on. So uh, I, I, we just was curious to observe how the uh, paid translators in, in large numbers can affect the community. Yeah. Right. So this is the issue of, I guess it would touch on people who can't be helped or who are not willing to be helped. Um, an editor who's editing for volume, you know, if they're being paid by the article and they want to just get as many articles up as possible, they've kind of moved themselves out of the low-hanging fruit category. We can help the people who are willing to work with us, but we can't really help people who, even if they're editing in good faith, aren't willing to slow down, check their own work, do a little bit of due diligence. And so any project that does hire people to translate by volume or anything like that is going to run into problems, I agree. Uh, yes, pinstripes. Um, well, I'm using the metaphor that you do. So, I mean, you naturally start off with, with this is bad. You know. um, so that we'll start off. I agree with you 100%. We just start a different metaphor. Uh, my question is you have, well, you have companies that have tens of thousands of employees who have had changes. You have uh, investors. Billions of companies who have a vested interest, perhaps. So once you start trying to peer into the heart of the motivation of individuals who contribute, you open a floodgates for trying to peer into the heart of the motivation for people to do any kind of thing. So my question is, do you not see that as a journey? That if you're going to require people because it's a commercial entity to disclose, why not for other people who have vested interest? Um, you have a point. Uh, in one sense, it's the top of a slippery slope. Uh, in another sense, we do need to draw a line somewhere. Um, I would agree with you that, you know, if I'm editing as a volunteer for my pet charity, that's pretty high up equal to paid editing. But there is a continuum of um, conflict of interest and how much damage a person is likely to do or uh, how much they're likely to want to push their organization's POV as opposed to just be editing about something they enjoy. You know, if I like my local ice cream shop, I'll probably go write an article on it if it's notable. Um, but I'm not going to be quite as likely to want to say, Joe's ice cream shop is the best in the world. Here's the phone number. Yeah. It's going to be a challenge that can't be. You're going to have to include 
Good point. Um, hello. Up here. Uh, hi. Uh, um, in the past, um, COI was, as a policy, invented so that people's conflicts of interest can be dealt with more properly, appropriately. Um, but um, in the past, I've experienced um, occasions, and I speak as an administrator of the English Wikipedia, that my de declaration of conflicts of interest has been used as evidence against me in discussions. For example, I, there was once I argued for uh, um, the retention of an article of someone whom I happen to know in person, and, and they said, no, Derek's rationale should be discounted, because, and I declared a conflict of interest that I know that person on the deletion discussion, and they said, no, Derek's rationale should be discounted because he's in conf conflicts of interest and we should delete this article. Like, do you think, my question is that, do you think the COI policy needs a complete overhaul to tell people that this is only a way to let people tell others their interests so that they can de be dealt with properly, rather than a policy with some sort of penalty or, or some sort of preferential treatment against those people? The COI guideline currently does not prohibit editing on a topic that you have a conflict of interest on, but you're correct that it carries a heavy stigma in the actual operation of Wikipedia. Um, and I would like to think that a proposal such as the one that I'm suggesting, something where we're encouraging people to disclose and continue to work with us, would actually lessen that stigma. Because right now, we have the problem of if you disclose, you're going to get people throwing rocks at you. And if we make it acceptable to disclose with the idea that you're being open about this, you're going to work with people, I think that that may actually improve the sort of situation that you're describing. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Um, should we move to a direction where we actually say that COI itself should not be allowed to be used as a rationale against someone? I mean, that would almost verge on a personal attack, in my personal opinion. If you're attacking someone only on the basis of, you have a COI, I have no real evidence that you're acting in bad faith or non-neutrally, but I'm going to throw that accusation at you. That seems like an attack to me. I have time for one more question. Um, just, just real quick. The, um, related to what Derek said, if you look at the articles of the worst COI in Wikipedia, this is the elephant in the room. It's always been university and college articles. You know, read the first two paragraphs, they read like brochures for these colleges and universities. There's hundreds of thousands of alumni and grads that are influenced in that article and no one really pushing back. So we have an obvious problem with that, just right with the university mm -hmm. and articles. Also, I'm wondering what kind of experiences people have had with PR folks. I was fascinated to run into this guy just by chance in New York City who worked for Rubenstein as a PR person and his job for a year or two was to go into Wikipedia and to fix articles of their clients. But what he did do was understand the policies of Wikipedia. He disclosed who he was on his user page. He went to the talk page of the article first and said, here's what I find is wrong. Here's what I propose to change. Please give me feedback. And he said 80 to 90% of the time, he got zero feedback. He made the change. It stuck. And I think that's a pretty interesting case study that we can build on for trying to find a solution for this long term. Yeah, I, I've also had experience with PR people who are perfectly willing to to disclose, to interchange with editors, if only someone will work with them. Okay. Uh, Kim, you need the laptop? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Well, if it works, it works. I don't give it. Here we go. All right. Oh, ship, ship. Um, that's not going to work. You're not logged in. Is this?
I just do it this way. So, my, hello, my name is Kim Bruning. I'm uh, uh, also an ex-admin, uh, I'm a retired admin on the English Wikipedia. And uh, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, a topic that I've been working on for a while. It has actually moved into the uh, Wikipedia namespace, it's actually an essay now. But, well, on the one hand, this is probably the longest prepared talk ever, because it's, uh, the pages existed for quite a while. And on the other hand, uh, I'm kind of hoping people will help by editing the page while I'm talking. We'll see how that works out. <laughs> that happened to my last presentation. I have, I have almost had the record of the latest prepared presentation at Wikimedia Mania. I want to improve it this year. As long as it loads. Mm -hmm. I did too, but I'll try again. Now it clicked. Good. Okay, so uh, what I'm talking about today is that Wikipedia has had a uh, started out, you know, as a new hopeful project where anything could happen, anything could be done, and over time we've added rules and more rules, and some of the things that we thought would work on Wikipedia or that actually did work on Wikipedia for a while are now no longer possible. This doesn't mean there aren't any good reasons why you don't want these things to happen anymore, but this is sort of like the collateral damage, and I'd just like to walk past those, uh, you know. So. Uh, let, let's have a look. So one of the first things that people were hoping that Wikipedia would be good for, and this is really one of the things I miss a lot, and, is the ability to establish priority. In, in, uh, in the beginning, we thought that, okay, tell you what, why can't scientists contribute to Wikipedia? Hang on, this is an old version of the page. How do you like that? Ah, there we go. See. Of course I can. Let's see. I know. Isn't Firefox wonderful? Well, who, who, who needs PowerPoint? Well, okay, except for those who want Chromium, but... Uh, just. Okay, so the first thing is that Wikipedia, we thought that scientists would come on Wikipedia and actually write articles on the things they were working on before they published any articles. This, was, this would have been really cool because, you know, uh, that way, uh, Wikipedia would have the most current information on science possible. We'd actually be first before the scientific journals. Unfortunately, we introduced a nice little rule called no original research, which shut out all of the uh, people who uh, were clearly idiots and uh, trying to, uh, uh, or I don't know, borderline schizophrenics and other kinds of crazy people who were putting all kinds of crazy articles into Wikipedia. And we locked them out, on, uh, at least on the English Wikipedia, but I believe also on many of the other wikis also have this rule now. Uh, but it also prevents scientists from editing, uh, adding these kinds of things, because now the rule is you first must publish something, and only then may you put things on Wikipedia. So scientists can't use Wikipedia to establish priority, and now we sort of run behind on the scientific journals. That's kind of unfortunate, it's too bad, but that's one of the poor things we've lost. So, um, another thing we've lost is that the, ability, the notability criteria sometimes tangle with the web web phenomena. Wikipedia is really, really great about reporting about things in the real world and that are, that are reported on in dead paper things too, because one of the notability criteria, which also most of the wikis have taken over, not all of them, but most, uh, is that, um, you know, it has to be published on paper. If you have something that is a web-only or internet-only phenomenon, well, it's not going to be so easy to write about. So, you may have heard about, uh, so on the English Wikipedia, for instance, people started removing all kinds of references to web comics, um, uh, to uh, important blogs that are, not report, are underreported on Wikipedia. Uh, so yeah, so once again we run behind. First something, has to, something on the web has to be published in the newspaper and then it comes back to Wikipedia and that's the only way we actually, well not always, but that's the best way to get into Wikipedia. Um, so that's really too bad. Uh, also, this, like I said, this is a really old page and people have actually added comments uh, on, the, on what's going on back onto the page. So a third thing, and this is actually the thing that's really you know, that really pisses, still pisses me off to this day, is that who here has heard of Usenet? All right, 
Who here thinks that Usenet is important and notable part of internet history? Okay, but unfortunately, on, according to Wikipedia rules, we should delete all, everything about Usenet. No, we actually haven't done that because we've got common sense, right? But the Usenet, everything, most of the things about, that are written about Usenet are all written on Usenet. And Usenet is not a reliable source, at least not in the English Wikipedia, it's defined as a non-reliable source. So we should de remove all of the unreliable sources from all the Usenet articles. And that leaves no reliable sources, so that means they're not sourced, so we can delete them. So all of Usenet should be deleted according to policy. According to reality, Usenet articles sort of stick around a little bit, but they're in limbo. Uh, but, the, it, I mean, everybody knows that Usenet is important, but there must be most, many other systems that, you know, I'm not thinking of right now that also might be important and that we're just not writing about because they, they don't, they, there's no notability criterion which would help us write about them. Not everything you see is only on paper, once again. All right, using Wikipedia as an anonymous research tool, this is, uh, my this is my original procedure, and actually, uh, when I talk to people, this is what I tell other people to do as well. Um, for using Wikipedia, if you want to research a topic, well, first of all, you just you know, search, for Wiki search Wikipedia for the topic, and if the topic doesn't exist, if you can create a new page for on that topic, which is like a good idea, which is everyone should do that. Except if you just do that, if you're a new user or an anonymous user, right, you can't create new pages anymore. Oh, great. And there's a proposal on English Wikipedia to not allow a new user to do it either. I'm not sure where that's going. That will be interesting. Um, so then once you've created the page, after you've created the page, mind you, you look around. Uh, you can find books and you find the links and you just toss all of your mess into the page uh, as a sort of a brain dump while you're doing your research. Of course, these days, if you do that, you get deleted within, what, five seconds? You get huggled or, um, what's the other systems called? There's got plenty, twinkled. twinkled. You get huggled or twinkled. And these days, it's like, okay, anytime I get huggled in IRC, I go like, why are you trying to delete me? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, you know, so the, people don't get time to build the page. Ah, so now, the next stage is refactoring. Refactoring is a lost art. It's used, it was used on old wikis and not so much on Wikipedia anymore. That you refactor the actual article page until it's readable. At that point in time, finally, in, in the old style of working, after a few days, you'd have a very nice, presentable page, actually referenced a bit too. Not even that bad. But you know, these days, uh, I mean, in the first three steps, it already got deleted three times, or it was prohibited. So, uh, so the old procedure of just you know using Wikipedia as a research tool, you filter the internet through Wikipedia, and if you're missing something, you add it to it. This is a very fast way to both add stuff to Wikipedia and help yourself. You know, enlightened self-interest. You know, this old method no longer works, which is too bad. I really like that method. As, uh, once again, of course, people have added comments to the thing, to their page, because this is an old page, and I hope other people add more comments to it, even today. Now, let's see if someone's been helping me with adding more illustrations to the page while I've been busy. That's right, hit F5 some more. No, nope, no luck, nothing. Go up. Go up. Up. What have you guys been doing to my page? <laughs> Someone's reverted it that quick? Let's have a look. I'm just going to, uh, sorry, I, I, I really like this. Hey, where's the page history gotten to? Ah, there we are. I, I, I use a different skin. No, I know, it's sort of, it's, uh, it's just. Yeah, I know, the mouse, the, the, this, this trackpad sucks. There we go. So who's been messing with the page, huh? And it revision. <laughs> Just in a boring presentation. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, unfortunately, I, I was sort of asking people to add this. If people add pictures fast, it might still happen. Um, so, 
So another obvious way to attract useful new users to Wikipedia that used to work really well is to have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. Did I mention lots of red links? The more, the redder the page, the better. Also, you have to deliberately add spelling errors. And oh, oh no, let's not do that. But in any case, put in lots of uh, red links. Uh, this doesn't really work so very well. Uh, first of all, if you add a red link to a page, someone will remove the red link sometimes. That's kind of like, uh, wait, the, this, this, you know, it's the link is to something not notable because, but there wasn't a page for it yet. We want to write the page. Gee, someone else has, can figure out whether it's notable or not. But they just remove the red links, so there's no red links. And then also when an anonymous user, because lots of people come onto Wikipedia and the first thing they do is they try to edit anonymously, and they click on a red link, and that was a big trap because of course red link pops up and edit this page. Hey, you've just got a new editor. Hopefully. You could also have a new vandal. But, uh, but you know, a lot of the time you might actually get a new ad editor just out of having lots of red links. But no red links, so yeah, that's another thing that's been lost through time because people just edit too darn quickly and not think about uh, what the consequences might be. Okay, so bidding new articles. So this is the other way. If you actually want to go down and write a new article entirely, I'm going to hit a five again just to be sure. No, nobody's adding any pictures. Why not add pictures? Make this prettier. What? Oh, I'm sorry. We haven't found a representative picture yet. Oh, okay, fair enough. Even this community is not that fast. I, uh, go down. Go down? Go down? Down, 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 down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. I'm going to go back up here for a second. So, so also, by the way, if anybody has comments or wants to yell at me, please do so, because otherwise I'm just going to stand here and talk all day, and that's going to be really boring. Tell the lucky truth. <laughs> I, 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 what happens if I leak it? Okay. Um, oh yeah. So this is this is the more extended version of the last one. Do I really want to tell this? Yeah. Okay. Good. So to write a new article and stuff, right? If you want to have a organic procedure. So you. Thank you very much. Five minutes. Great. So I'm I'm going to sort of speed through this. If you want to have an organic procedure for making pages, it's actually becoming harder and harder and harder to edit. That's what the gym of the well was for, I guess. If you create a new page, right? An anonymous user can't even create a new page. Um, if people, uh, if you then go like, okay, well, I know a bit about this topic, why don't I just dump that on the page? So you drop everything you know on the page, you start typing, and you've got sort of a basic outline. You know, people still might want to do that, but you know, all, all, there's all kinds of rules, especially on English Wikipedia, but on the other Wikipedia, it's getting worse and worse too, or better. Well, worse, mostly. So there's all these, this whole list of rules you see on, the, uh, on here. No notability, not verified, messy stuff, no references on verifiable. You know, it's going to get uh, speedy deleted. Um, then you edit it into something readable. OK, so now at least the page is readable, but it's still not notability. It's not wikified, it's not a stub, it's unverifiable. So once again, if a CD editor comes along while you are in this stage, the page gets deleted again. So uh, it, another set of new users vanish from Wikipedia forever lost. Um, so then finally you get into wikifying it and find some internal links. Uh, which is, well, you still don't have notability as, if established. You have the stub, it's unverifiable, delete. And then you start actually doing your research at step five. But uh, notability is still entirely established. So, uh, and finally, you know, this is after about a week of editing. The page will generally hit all the points, and you'll probably have recruited lots of other Wikipedians to help you. This is how Wikipedia used to work. But right now, this is the only point in time when you, the page actually gets kept and improved. So what do people do these times? How much time left? Very little. Very little. So what people do these days is they actually create a user page and create an entire article, de novo. And um, it's actually really, really hard for new users to get into editing Wikipedia because the organic process has been removed due to ver just way too fast speedy deletion. OK, let's have a very quick look at some of the other things. Nope. OK, so, so this is probably the, the one and only presentation uh, given that it's actually already an official page in the essay namespace. That's fast, huh? Um, and what I really love to see people do is take a look at this page and improve it and edit it. This is also, 
I also don't know many presentations here who ask people to actually edit a wiki page anymore. So that's another lost functionality. Please edit it. It's a wiki. All right, and thank you very much for your time. Oh, here it is. Try to connect it to this computer. Ah, uh, no, I'm not going to use slides. I just. Okay. So, yeah, Good morning. It's still very early in the morning for me, I think, so I'm going to do two things that I would want to. Um, first of all, I'm going to keep it short, and second of all, I'm not going to use any slides. So <laughs> this was going to be things that the media say that aren't true, but half the presentation would be all about how we aren't WikiLeaks, and that isn't any fun for anyone. So, so instead, I too am going to build on something that we did last year at Wikimania, or actually before Wikimania at Wikisim, which is the research conference on wikis, not just Wikipedia, but all wikis. So uh, the first day, uh, one of the days was an unconference day in which I held a workshop for myths about wikis, things that people know about wikis that aren't true. <laughs> and we had a great workshop, and there are things still up on the Wikisim 2010 page if you want to take a look at it. So I picked out some that are particularly relevant to Wikipedia for this presentation. I'm going to tell you the title of the presentation last because I think it's the most important one and the one that you'll find the most relevant. So in this group, all of us were basically wiki experts. We knew a lot about the technology. People always come to us and ask, like, oh, will you help me make my wiki? You know, what can I do? Why didn't my wiki turn out the way I wanted it to? And a lot of it because of these things that people believe that aren't true. So here are 10 things that everybody knows about Wikipedia that aren't true. And saying things that you don't know is pretty dangerous in this crowd because people probably know, again, better than I do. But most people don't. So number one is that teachers in schools hate Wikipedia. You've heard this, and to paraphrase the journalist who talked to Sue earlier, going on about how much teachers hate Wikipedia is so 2007. You saw the success of the public policy initiative and how it added megabytes of text to Wikipedia. It got hundreds of teachers and students involved. But people still love to quote this fact that teachers in schools hate Wikipedia, forbid Wikipedia. You can't use it in class. It's unreliable. Nobody lets you use Wikipedia. But everybody's using Wikipedia in class. So why does this myth persist? It's just not interesting to like Wikipedia anymore. Everyone uses it. It's contrary to hate Wikipedia. That's pretty good. You know how crazy people make the news because they believe in weird things. People who hate Wikipedia make the news. That's pretty interesting. But most people actually have a much more reasonable belief. The people who like it don't unquestionably believe it should be used for everything, and the people who don't think that you should cite it for your research reports don't necessarily think it's the devil. So if we could just get everyone to stop saying that teachers in schools hate Wikipedia, this would be a great uh, advancement. Number two is that Wikipedia is the best example of a wiki. And when we did this workshop, the people who don't identify as Wikipedians, the people who are more about, you know, Wikia or Ward's Wiki or the pattern repositories, this really made their ears steam when everybody assumes, like, oh, you work on wikis. So tell me about Wikipedia. So the definition of a wiki. <coughs> can actually get my mouse here, is just a website that allows the creation and editing of any number of interlinked wiki pa uh, web pages via a web browser using a simplified markup language. I got this from Wikipedia. It may or may not be true. <laughs> Wikipedia is very unlike most other wikis that exist. Most are pretty simple. The essential parts of a wiki are quick editing. Most of them don't have history, they don't have a variety of features, and they aren't encyclopedias. Wiki alone doesn't even refer to Wikipedia. But everybody thinks that Wikipedia is the best example of a wiki. I think Wikipedia is the best example of Wikipedia. Number three is that Wikipedia is the best example of the wisdom of crowds. This wasn't in our workshop, but Jimmy keeps bringing this up as something that he really hates, so this one is for him. And The Wisdom of Crowds was a pretty good book. And unusually for good books, it sold pretty well. It sold in airports. And it was even featured in articles with people who read about it, who had not, in fact, read the book. So 
The wisdom of crowds is the idea that when you have a crowd of people, they can make a better decision than one person on their own. And that's a really attractive idea, especially when you have a lot of people working on a project. But what was actually in the book is that there are a couple conditions that need to be present for that to actually be true. Diversity, independence, decentralization, and aggregation. Diversity, the idea that the different people involved have different opinions. Independence, that these, independence, uh, these opinions aren't related to each other and aren't affected by each other. Decentralization, that they aren't all given by some central authority. And aggregation, that you have some way to combine them into one, uh, into one single output. So Wikipedia has some of these categories, but not all of them, and definitely not independence. You're pretty uh, in influenced by what you're reading elsewhere and what other people are saying on the site. Not every massively collaborative project that involves a crowd is actually an example of the wisdom of crowds. In fact, to quote Wired, when people can learn what others think, the wisdom of crowds may veer toward ignorance. Fortunately, Wikipedia has ways to correct against that, but it's certainly not the same type of problem. Number four is that Wikipedia is in the public domain. In fact, if you look at uh, arguments about licensing, and most of, these people, most of the people in this room probably have, you know very well that Wikipedia is not in the public domain. When you talk to people outside this conference hall, they don't seem so sure. Well, most of them think everything on the internet is public domain. And they act as if it's true, too. How many of you have seen pictures from commons that don't even have attribution, or text from Wikipedia taken, and you'd call people on it and they say, oh, it was on Wikipedia, why can't I use it? Well, of course you can use it, but just not under the public domain. Number five is that Wikipedia is communism. You're all a bunch of hippies. <laughs> well, maybe you are a bunch of hippies, and you're all very nice people. And there probably is a lot of public spirit involved. There certainly is a lot of public spirit involved. But the recent editor surveys suggest that a lot of you do it also because it's fun. Everyone has their own interests. Some of you like languages, some of you like writing bots, some of you like learning more about your favorite topic. But it's certainly not pure self-interest that keeps you here. And it's certainly not a lack of pure self-interest that keeps other people from participating. I really loved Jokai Benkler's ke keynote uh, address that suggests that even if we are cooperative, that's not so weird. That's what we all do. We aren't special for doing it. Another thing that people believe that aren't true, number six, is that vandalism is the biggest problem Wikipedia has. <laughs> Whenever you talk to somebody about Wikipedia, they ask like, oh, how do you control all the vandalism? What would you do if you could ever stop vandalism? Man, if vandalism were the biggest problem we had, I would be so happy that we could have, we would throw a large party in this, uh, this hall right now. We could get some better bots, uh, have a small team to look at the false positives and false negatives, and live happily ever after. Unfortunately not. Vandalism's easy to spot, and that's part of why it's not such a big deal. It's pretty annoying. It's easy to understand and easy to see. You know immediately when something has been vandalized. It's obviously bad, but it's so cheap to fix that it's nowhere near our biggest problem. Number seven is that errors are easy to spot. I was originally going to use slides for this talk, in fact. At eight o'clock in the morning, I looked over them and I realized that I had omitted number seven, so I thought I should put it in here. One example of this errors being easy to spot is the Siegenthaler incident mentioned earlier. How many people saw that and just had no idea that that wasn't true? Number eight is that anonymous editing, anonymous editing is anonymous. We may not know your name, but that doesn't mean that we can't figure out who you are. All of us give away information as we edit, and in fact, as mentioned, if you register under a pseudonym, you're much more anonymous than if you reveal your IP address to the world. This became increasingly clear as Virgil Griffith's wiki scanner came out a couple years ago and people began to realize that, oh, what you edit can be connected to where you're coming from. Number nine is one that everybody knows and everybody knows more and more. And this one is for Phoebe, who would really like this to be spread more widely. And it's that Wikipedia isn't any fun anymore. And if you're here, you probably don't believe this. And at least I hope you don't believe this. Maybe you've come out of Wikimania even more refreshed and thinking it's more fun than before, and I certainly hope that that's true. But if you're just a consumer of news rather than a producer of information, you might have a completely different picture. 
Everybody talks in the news about the problems. Wikipedia is dying. Wikipedia is vandalized. It's unreliable. You can't trust it. It's hostile to women, minorities. It doesn't, really, uh, it doesn't reflect the global south. What's not in the news anymore, because it's not a story anymore, is that this is a really fun thing to do. It's really cool you're creating something, you're contributing to the world's knowledge. That's not in the news, but it needs to be spread more widely for people who won't hear it in any other place. And number 10 was the title of my, uh, title of my workshop at Wikisim, and it's If You Build It, They Will Come, which is a line from a terrible movie that nobody should see. But people keep repeating this. <laughs> As standard wisdom for wikis, oh, you just put it up on the web and people will edit and it will be great. And everybody who tries this is severely disappointed when it doesn't actually work that way. If you build it and you put a lot of work in it and you, put, and you recruit your friends to put a lot of work in it and you promote it and you build it and you put all the right structures in place so that when people do come they can do something great, then maybe if you're lucky they will come. And that's what you have to do. In light of the editor trends survey that suggests that Wikipedia is dying, and that really is a crisis, despite how the news has misinterpreted Jimmy's statements over the past couple days as saying that it's not very important, everybody knows that now, you shouldn't believe it. If you build it, they won't come. If you build it and you work on it and you, uh, and you try to preserve it, and you really put some effort into it, then they'll come and you will be able to build Wikipedia, which will be the greatest repository of knowledge on Earth. So, 10 things about Wikipedia that aren't true. I'm the one who picked up the microphone, so clearly I'm <laughs> moderating this session. Um, <laughs> be bold in running Wikimania sessions. So, um, this is a panel. We're people. Four of us you've heard from. The other two of us are Tom at the end and me, James. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, um, a panel mostly relies on us talking to each other, but that's really boring, um, especially because you've just heard four of us talk anyway. So what we'd really like is questions, you know, challenges, telling us we're all wrong and we have no idea what we're talking about. So um, if anybody would like to kind of kick us off or, you know, let's get started. Uh, up there. Oh, great. We're just starting all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> you can yell at us too if you like. You can yell at us too if you like. Don't encourage me. Don't worry, you. I don't have the voice to yell. Do not feed the phone. <laughs> well, I have one question first for Jim and then one question for Karen. Um, for Karen, actually, I was kind of wondering, although I am an English Wikipedia editor, I am mostly active now on a different <coughs> language project, and I do notice that the editor, Ethan Magassi, is not supposed to be anonymous editors. The problem is in my country, anonymous editors by and large do three things. Either A, they vandalize the pages, B, they make new pages, simply say, why is this article not here? You should you should be making these articles for me, fuck you. The third, <laughs> yes, I'm serious. The third is they add information which unfortunately cannot be made into, well, let's put it this way. They try to make an article and say, why did, just recently, why did you say this out, Philippine national hero? write a poem called To the Filipino Youth. It's because he felt that the Filipino youth were supposed to be nationalistic, written by this class. So, um, and there have been proposals in our community to restrict editing only to register users because the problem of vandalism is extremely bad. So how do we, how do we like counterbalance the intentions of good editors who want to contribute anonymously and obviously the bad actors out there who write those such articles? Are they actually vandalizing? Do you define vandalism as any kind of 
edit that is not usable, or do you define vandalism as an edit that is intentionally, intentionally made to uh, damage the wiki? Oh, don't worry. They also blank pages, and they write like "I love you." <laughs> yes, but there's two. There's there's very different things, right? You, you always you're going to get the 15 year old kids uh, that are bored at school and are going to vandalize Wikipedia. I, you know, there's no way to fix that. Well, you can block the, you can, you can, you know, you can do a block, uh, block of the school. Wait. <laughs> hmm? It's not the best idea. I guess. Um, do you have anything to say? I've got some. So, um, one of the things that English Wikipedia is uh, currently debating uh, is whether or not to block uh, new pages by auto-confirmed users. Sorry, by non-auto-confirmed users. Uh, <laughs> I haven't had enough uh, caffeine this morning. Um, and uh, uh, actually, to be fair, you could block stuff by the auto-confirmed users too, and then there would be no vandalism. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, the, the, the interesting thing that the opponents of this have been putting forward is there's actually statistics showing that the vast majority of people who contribute are doing good things. Uh, and the vast majority of the IP users, anonymous users, are which aren't the same thing as Kat has pointed out, um, are doing good things. And the way to do it is to, is to look at it as objectively as you can and say, are they doing more harm than good? Actually, you'll find they probably aren't. They're probably doing a lot of good things. And, and when I do new page patrolling, I'm constantly surprised not by how many bad things there are, but how many good things. Um, but uh, it restores my faith in humanity somewhat. <laughs> I'd just like to um, back up what Tom said. So the foundation did a study a couple of months ago which found that the largest, if you took a big sample of uh, new edits and by IPs or new users and you ran them through, you know, a little thing, i.e. is this acceptable, is this bad, is this obviously intentionally malicious or is this, you know, just good, you found that by far the largest group were edits which were perfectly fine. Uh, that was a plurality. If you add in uh, edits which were exceptional into that, you get a majority. I think that your concerns about um, vandalism are valid and they're probably replicated by people uh, in the English Wikipedia. This isn't just, this isn't because I think that the majority of new edits are vandalism. I think it's because Vandalistic edits tend to stick in the mind. You know, you remember bad experiences, you remember good things. You don't necessarily remember, uh, you remember bad experiences and, you know, bad edits. You don't necessarily remember the good ones because you don't have to do anything with them. Good edits, by definition, don't rock the boat. You don't have to revert them, you don't have to put any edit, you just uh, effort into it, you just close the tab and, you know, it's gone forever. Um, I have a comment and a question to make. First comment about paid editing. Um, I would be more optimistic about the pink unicorns, actually. First, because I do know some people who have a second account on which they freelance, and I think they just write good, solid articles. The second, uh, most of our famed LAMP projects are actually conflict of ed interest edits all the time. Um, I have a question about anonymous edits um, and new articles. Because the German Wikipedia doesn't have it, anonymous users still can make new articles, which I think makes no big problem. So if any evaluation, if it helped anything to um, forbid them to make new articles. So conflict of interest is a topic of deep interest to me, um, partially because I was on the arbitration committee when we formed the English Wikipedia's kind of concept of conflict of interest as it currently stands, um, for which I am almost eternally um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so for example, a very strict reading of the conflict of interest policy on the English Wikipedia means that almost every edit I've ever made is a conflict of interest, because my speciality is writing articles about British politicians, law and constitution and history, and I'm British, which means I'm affected by that. But I'm also human, which means I'm affected by that, because I live in the country down the road that's still affected by how the British runs its state. We're all interconnected, and we're all affected by each other. So what we're really saying is there's a spectrum of conflict of interest, and that, that beyond a certain point, you have to spend a little bit more extra caution and care um, so that people can be confident of your neutrality. We're not saying that because 
you work for Microsoft, that you can never write an article related to Microsoft or its competitors. It means that um, because we're a wiki, because we're an open community, and we uh, get a lot of our value from being open, you know, we, we, I mean, there are lots of bits of software out there that allow anyone uh, with a user account to edit a website. WordPress is one of them, but it's not a wiki. You know, we are a wiki. We're about a community that is open and engaged. And conflict of interest is about having trust in each other and having the decency and honesty to tell each other where other people might doubt us and that we're aware of that. It's not about saying there is a you know, solid brick wall as the moment money comes into the equation. Because as Andrew said earlier, you know, uh, every university pretty much has a glowing article on Wikipedia. Well, some of them are really quite bad, because otherwise, you know, no one would try and go to the other ones. But why does their Wikipedia article not say that? Well, because, you know, the kind of people who edit Wikipedia are often students or ex-students. And they don't want to say nasty things about their college. And I don't give a damn about the colleges I never went to. So um, there's a conflict of interest in every, all of us. And part of a mature wiki community is accepting that and, you know, recognize it in ourselves. So, um, can I step in on the CO1? Um, so there's an example, actually. Um, a friend of mine who works for the BBC, um, he edits under, uh, well, under a well-known pseudonym. Um, and and uh, he is the nicest guy you could ever imagine, and he uh, does very, very good stuff for the BBC, and he wanted to edit the page about uh, the project he works on at the BBC. And he disclosed that he is... Uh, he disclosed his um, status, he disclosed his COI, and after that, I had to tell him, on the basis of policy, that he shouldn't be editing that article. Um, is there a commercial conflict of interest? Well, not really. Um, it's the BBC. Then the, the thing he works on isn't a commercial issue. He works on um, about one of the most public service-y things that the BBC does. The COI guidelines seem slightly broken when somebody can't edit an open source or sorry, a free culture project about how uh, about a project within inside the BBC to make the BBC more compatible with free culture. That seems like the COI guidelines are broken somehow. Uh. <laughs> Unless I'm misunderstanding, I think you overreached there. Um, the COI gui guideline does not say that your friend can't edit. It says that he needs to take due care, perhaps propose on the talk, make sure he's editing neutrally. I mean, I work for a tech company that had a big project out earlier this year that I was involved in, and I have made some edits to that article on that topic. Um, I disclosed on the talk page that I had a COI. Instead of making large changes to the article, I limited myself mostly to making you know, small maintenance changes and suggesting others' changes on the talk. And you know, unless someone wants to block me, I think I was well within guidelines in doing that. Uh, we over-enforce the concept of COI, I think, which is not to say that having a conflict of interest doesn't make you non-neutral, doesn't make it problematic, because it does. But it doesn't mean you can't edit, and it doesn't mean that you are marked for life. OK, can I come back? <laughs> <laughs> are there any other questions, by the way? Yeah. Uh, so the, the flip side to that is I think we could solve the same problem by um, cracking down on crappy little business articles. Because there's thousands of them, and they're crappy. And um, if you go onto English Wikipedia and you type in WP colon B2B, it will t it's a wonderful essay, a user essay, about the inherent non-notability of people who do things on the internet for money, like SEO consultants and social media consultants and people like that. They should be considered non-notable because they're not doing something notable. Telling people how to use the internet for money isn't really something. I mean, we should... I'm almost tempted to say we should just go and delete all those things, but um, that would make me mean. So. <laughs> uh. Yeah, it's like we had an uh, April Fools uh, a few years back, in which the article Earth was put up for article at articles for deletion on the grounds that all the sources were primary and written by somebody with a conflict of interest. <laughs> Uh, well, who are questions? Mine is it's just a comment more than a question. Uh, please do remember that English Wikipedia is not 
I repeat, is not the center of the universe. It's not. So, <laughs> please, uh, so please, uh, it's just a comment. I mean, if you just say that anonymous users cannot make new articles, it's just on nWiki. Yeah. Their wiki allows it. France, uh, Francois wiki allows it. Italian Wikipedia so, uh, allows it. So, so just don't be. I agree. So I was around uh, when the Siegenthaler incident came along. In fact, I was around when I, as a sysop, had special SQL as a function, which I saw Kim had his thing. A lot of things change. We have lost functionality, and the English Wikipedia suffers from this a lot more than other wikis. A lot of wikis have. Um, I'm going to be controversial, have a better setup of their wiki. They, they have, you know, they're more like an actual wiki. And I agree that, you know, other no, wikis have done it not right. not saying that. And so, but no, 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 you're right. I mean, you may not be saying it, but you're right anyway. And uh, <laughs> so, so, for example, um, five years ago we said uh, we're going to suspend temporarily the right of anonymous editors to create articles on the English Wikipedia. This was... Um, as part of the count, uh, set of measures we did after Siegenthaler. Temporary, five years. Those two don't go together very well. And what we said was that the solution to this is we will write some software into MediaWiki that would allow you to make a change, but for that change not to go live immediately, including creating an article. Uh, those of you who have seen what happened with that piece of software on the English Wikipedia, hundreds of thousands of lines of text from people arguing back and forth as to whether we should have 27,000 or 28,000 different tests of the same software. You know, the English Wikipedia community is in some ways broken and has itself to blame. And we, mostly representing the English Wikipedia community, are actually here with uh, things we have done wrong. Sure things we've done wrong and which um, you So people just don't do it on your own Wikipedia. That's, that's the, the message. So I should learn a new language and fix, uh, you know, a different wiki. Okay. Well, possibly. Okay. Uh, no. uh, well. Another question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, question. Any other questions? Oh. The second question. All right. All right. There we go. Now I have the microphone. Yeah. All right. Yay. Um, the question was supposed to, uh, my question's for Karen, because on paid editing, there has been concern. I think this was raised on several mailing lists about the Indonesian Wikipedia writing contests, where supposedly money was motivation, or was it somewhere, but there was a project somewhere in my part of the world, where money was used as a motivator to get people to write Wikipedia articles, sponsored by the chapters, of course. And, you know, for some reason, there have been plans by some of the chapters, including myself, and including my own chapter to get people to be paid to write quality Wikipedia articles supposedly because money is a good motivator in the developing world. Especially when it comes to how underrepresented, for example, developing country topics are on the English Wikipedia. So, but there have been, I think I've heard some anecdotal evidence that proves that even if you pay them, they don't stick and they don't stay. So does that mean necessarily that Paid editing is not a strong enough motivator to keep people in the community, or does it mean something else? Uh, I think joining the community is a completely different issue than editing Wikipedia or adding content to Wikipedia. And giving people money is probably not going to make them stick around as part of the community. It may get you articles. You're, you're we tried that. grabbing my microphone. Sorry, Sangha. <laughs> uh, guys, you're, you're throwing off my train of thought here. <laughs> Um, but incentivizing by money or any other way is not necessarily going to make someone engage with the community who isn't already going to engage with the community. And I'll make a point here that we have on English Wikipedia something called the Wiki Cup, which is just a shiny bauble that you get to put on your talk page if you win, you get bragging rights. And we still have people who end up in wells of drama for having edited just to be able to get that cup or that shiny bauble. And I, I, suspect that what you're describing might have run into similar difficulties. Is that the reason also why we keep money on the farm? 
So, so Wikimoney was an experiment in 2004 on the English Wikipedia, I believe, where everyone started with a um, balance of uh, 100 units, and you could set up bounties, say, I'll give you a unit if you improve this article or add a reference to here or write an article on an MP. And um, it was most notably used um, to fill out the histories of British parliamentarians, and there were about 2,000 outstanding parliamentarians uh, you know, and um, I think the system basically went bankrupt because people said, I will give all my money, the, all I could possibly give for, you know, one unit for every MP you write. And someone said, I'll give you two units for every MP you write. And ultimately, we ended up with a lot of people with no money uh, in the system and no one cared. And then we stopped. <laughs> <laughs> quantitative easing. <laughs> oh, man. So there's all, there's all kinds of research, if you read this kind of thing, about how introducing money into a system that used to be a gift, uh, gift economy changes all the incentives and it changes people's behavior about things. Uh, most of it seems to suggest that if, uh, if the money involved is really small, you're probably going to, do, to not only not get as much as what you were getting with, uh, with the plain gift economy or non-monetary, but you might even discourage people who were interested in it before, because now it's not something fun. It's like work, you're getting paid for it, and you're not even getting paid very much. So, <laughs> so if you're paid to do it as a full-time job, maybe that's incentive. Like, I'll do a lot of boring things if I get pulled, paid a full-time salary. Maybe contests, not so much. Uh, sometimes, if a prize is enough, it really depends on what the prize is and what the, the expectations are around it. But uh, mostly, uh, those sort of things... You might try doing contests with things other than money also to see how they work. So. One last question? Or? I was just going to make a comment. Um, so I'm not sure if we have any data on, uh, incent or objective data on whether people can be incentivized to edit with money. The number of um, people in the PR industry who obviously try to would indicate that there's something there. But I agree that they're not going to stick around in the community. And I'm not sure if this is because the idea of incentivizing them is flawed or because we're incentivizing them for creating articles, which is distinct from engaging with the community. So the um, public policy initiative in the United States, and Kat is probably going to hit me with something for saying this, uh, was a great success in terms of article creations. What it essentially said was, uh, Students at various universities and colleges in America will be uh, given course credits for modules which, as part of it, involve creating articles. And the incentive was for creating articles, and we had lots and lots of text added, a phenomenal amount of text. But the number of people who chose to stay around in the community afterwards were very small, because you're not giving them an incentive to do that. As soon as they've completed the module, that's it. They have absolutely no obligation. They have absolutely no reason to edit, unless they are the sort of people who would have wanted to edit beforehand. Uh, and the same is probably true of uh, providing money, I'd think. Uh, yeah, that's it. OK, uh, I'm from Nepali Wikipedia. And uh, uh, we have 15,000 articles there. And I've been trying to increase the number of articles and the quality of articles. And apparently, we don't have a machine translation for the specific language, and uh, we do have for Hindi and all, all others. And I, um, so uh, for the motivation to increase the number of articles, uh, one thing that I thought was um, machine translation and having these things. And the other was like, uh, there should be some kind of motivation and or some other uh, users. And the first one, the machine translation uh, that I tried, I mean, actually, since there was no machine translation, I tried to create my own. And then I uh, proposed or I talked with this. And uh, people say that now machine translation is really not good. And uh, what should we do? The first question, and the, uh, I'm trying to, I'm sorry, but uh, it's a, and the next thing is uh, while motivating people, um, everybody says that that it, money would be the best motivating thing because they've been talking so long uh, things. So uh, somebody says that money uh, spoiled the entire spirit and everything. So um, how should we, I mean, go ahead and increase or what would the motivating factors and all? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, so one of the things um, uh, I've been involved with the Victoria and Albert Museum um, GLAM uh, outreach that we did the other week um, in London. 
And one of the things which they specifically asked for was multilingual um, outreach. And they basically said, we've got all these objects which we've basically nicked from India. It's one th small thing we could do would be to try and actually make sure that people in all languages in India can actually read about them. Um, and one of the things we've, we did was we, we tried very, very hard to go to Wiki Project India and also uh, IRC and a bunch of other places to get different Indian languages to participate in the day online. And we've been sending the material and um, by the end of the, uh, basically we started with an article in English, uh, German, Italian and French. And by the end of the day, we had it in Tamil, Hindi. Um, they'd improved a whole load of stuff on Gujarat um, and Catalan and Spanish and a bunch of other languages. Um, it seems to me that, the, uh, that there's a really good motivation there in as much as um, it's getting people to work on something very, very specific. It's a lot of fun because you're working with people from all over the planet and really, really surprising because you sit there and you're bashing away in English. And then you refresh the page, and oh my god, somebody's just added it in Danish. And then you hit again, and oh my god, there's one in Tamil. And then it keeps on going like that. But you then build up the, the links between the languages and the links between the communities. And you then start saying, oh, well, the stuff I'm doing is we're going and finding all these pictures and describing them, working out the sources. So one th OK, I should wrap up. One thing which the GLAM community could do is make sure that they work with museums to say, we need to do lots and lots of multilingual um, projects, make sure that all our GLAM outreach is done in a multilingual way. And that provides the intrinsic motivation, because it's fun and it's interesting. Um, and I think that's going to do far more than like, sending money to people to write articles. I don't know. Is that? Uh, yeah. <laughs>